who want to light some fires for an effective ministry. Now, there are times when lighting fires are not a good thing. It's not a good thing. Would you agree with that? Brother Brian knows about that. I told him I wouldn't tell the story about when he almost burned his old church down and sent three kids to the hospital. I'll leave that up to him. A little spoiler alert there. But I did hear about Jerry Clower. Y'all familiar with Jerry Clower? Are y'all cultured enough to know Jerry Clower? Jerry Clower talks about lighting a fire one time. I love Jerry Clower stories. He talked about how he and his brother Sonny had been tasked with getting the rats out of the barn. He said, but they were clever, and he said they were running around, and he said a bunch of them, he said about a hundred of them piled up underneath the chicken brooder. And he said, if you don't know what a chicken brooder is, it looks like a metal funnel turned upside down. And he said they all piled up underneath there, and our job was to get them out of the barn, get them killed. And he said, I come up with an idea. So I told my brother Sonny, go get the gasoline. And he said, how you got gasoline? In another story, he said, how you got gasoline? Back in those days, you take a siphon hose. He said, if you guys are not cultured enough to know what a siphon hose is, it's a long tube you stick down in the gas tank. He said, we would take it and stick it down in the gas tank of our A-model car just and get the gas going and bring it out of the A-model car into a jug, and then we'd use that for whatever we needed to use it for. He said, some folks call that an Arkansas credit card. Amen. The kids are like, what? <laughs> and he said, Sonny went and got the gasoline, and they brought it in there, and the rats are all gathered up underneath the chicken brooder, and they dumped it down into the, uh, and down into the chicken brooder and took a match and struck it and lit it and threw it down there, and boom! The job was done. Get the rats out of the barn. He said, the only problem was there was a hundred balls of fire headed for the hay barn. That was the only problem. Sometimes lighting things that are on fire is not good. We don't need any fire in the hay barn, but I'll tell you where we do need fire at is in the Lord's house. We need fire in our ministries. We are living in one of the most pivotal segments of time, a time when it seems that things are changing drastically. And it's a time when we begin to wonder how we're going to even do the things that God has tasked us to do. How are we going to win the lost? How are we going to disciple the ones that we win? And we talk about churches, and we tend to label churches, and, well, this church is too progressive, and, and, and this church is too stagnant. So what do we need to do? Well, friends, we need a fresh approach to the study of God's Word. We need to be purpose-driven in all that we do. Listen, we should never stop putting goals in front of ourselves. We should never stop placing mountains and obstacles to overcome. We should never stop sharing vision for the future. We need to be willing to grow where the Lord leads us to grow. And in our text tonight, Paul gives Timothy, a young, young minister, some advice about lighting the fires of an effective ministry. Look with me if you would. 2 Timothy chapter 1 and begin in verse 6. He says, Wherefore I, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner. But be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death, and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Let's stop right there. I want to share with you three things very quickly tonight about lighting the fires of an effective ministry here in Florence Street Baptist Church. Notice, first of all, that he tells Timothy to stir up the gift of God. Stir up the gift of God in verse 6. He mentions 
how his ministry will commence. How it commenced in verse 6. He said, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. His ministry began by God giving him the gift, the grace gift that is in his life which came from God. It didn't come from Paul. It came from God. It was only made official in Timothy by the laying on of his hands on him. This was the ordination service of young Timothy. Paul was validating the ministry of Timothy, validating the gift, the grace gift that God had given to young Timothy. The Holy Spirit seems to have administered unto Timothy a special gift. He was probably a, a teacher, pastor, a, the gift of teaching and, and pastoring for his occupation. And apparently, Paul was afraid of something that many preachers and, and many Christians ought to be afraid of. Paul was afraid that Timothy might neglect the gift that God had given him. So he says, I put you in remembrance to stir up the gift of God. The gift that God has put in you, stir it up. This is where it commences. Each of us have been gifted by God in certain ways. Thank you, Brian. Each of us have been gifted in some way or another. You have a gift that God has placed in you. It may not be a spiritual gift like the apostles had in their day, but God does gift us in certain ways. Some people are gifted to play music, and I praise God for them. Some people are gifted to sing, and we praise God for them. Some people are gifted to, to preach uh, or to teach. They just are given that gift by God. And some people are gifted to counsel and to guide other people and to give wisdom to other people. You ought to use that gift. You ought to stir it up. Some people are gifted to serve. I, I think about uh, Richard and Ruth Gillespie who showed up here. Their pastor in Arkansas called me and he said, Listen, I, I'm, sending, I'm sending to you, they're moving there, two of the best church members anybody could ever ask for. And he said, their name is Richard and Ruth Gillespie. You're going to love them. And I said, well, we got a couple we'll send back to you. Amen? I'll let y'all figure out who they are. Look at the exchange rate going. He said, you're going to love Richard and Ruth Gillespie. And they showed up, and the first thing they did was, where can we serve? I said, well, what do you want to do? They said, we heard about this homeless ministry. We used to do a catering business, and we're used to cooking in mass quantities. And they took the gift that they have to serve, and they're using it. And I don't do this to, to pour out praise upon them because they wouldn't accept that they would only turn it to God. But they are taking the gift that they've been giving, and they're, and they're stirring it up and using it for the glory of God and for the effectiveness of the ministries of this church. That's what we ought to do with those gifts. Stir them up. Some people have the gift of technology. And praise God for all you people. I touch my computer and it says, stop it. Stop touching me. I have to call Tim all the time and ask him and Brother Russell. Brother Russell, he's got to where he screens all my calls. And these people know how to do these things. And I praise God. But whatever your gift is, you ought to stir that gift up. That word stir up. It, it, the phrase literally means to stir into a full blaze. And what happens so often in people's lives is, is God will gift them with the ability to do something, but they allow that gift to go dormant. They, they stop using that gift, or they find some excuse about why they can't use that gift anymore. And Paul said, listen, this is going to be a danger for you, Timothy, to keep that gift going. The greatest temptation that Christians often face may not even be an ethical problem or an ethical temptation. Sometimes it will not be a moral temptation. Sometimes the greatest temptation we face as Christians is a motivational temptation to either coast through our Christian life or even worse, to simply quit. That's a temptation. You know, I haven't been doing this very long. I haven't been in ministry very long. I haven't been preaching and pastoring very long. But the people who have quit that I was side by side with at one time just 15 years ago is staggering to me that they've already quit. And Pastor West mentions, you know, his class from seminary back in Little Rock. And, 
and how many of them are no longer in the ministry at all. There's a temptation there. And even if you don't necessarily leave the church, listen, you get this down. You don't have to leave the church to quit. You can quit and sit down right where you are and allow your gifts to go dormant and to not be used of God. If God has given you a gift, stir it up. He says, listen, Timothy, I put you in remembrance to stir up the gift of God that has been placed in you and by the laying on of my hands. That's how his ministry commenced. Here, secondly, notice how his ministry would continue in verse 7. Uh, God, you say, well, how in the world can I continue? I'm tired, I'm discouraged, I'm weary. Well, listen, look in verse 7. For God has not given us the spirit of fear. Here's how your ministry continues. But it's given us the spirit of power and of love and a sound mind. You see, your power is going to come from God. Listen, I want you to know this. Any fear and any doubt in any faithlessness that we have as Christians or as a church does not come from God. It only comes from our enemy, Satan. If we stand here before you and we said, hey, listen, this is the vision that we have. We're going to have 500 editions and we're going to do this and do that. The fearfulness of people would become overwhelming. Hey, we're going to build a building and we're going to do this. I can see where God's taking us in the next five years and ten years. People begin to get overwhelmed by that. But let me tell you where that fear comes from. It does not come from the Lord God Almighty. It comes from Satan who plants the seeds of fear in our hearts. And he says, you can't do this. Uh, no, there's no way that would ever happen. And, and the men and women of God begin to shrink away from the greatness of God. And we take the greatness of God and we set it aside and we settle for the goodness of God when there's so much more. That spirit of fear does not come from God. What are you afraid of, Christian? What are you afraid of? Hey, there was a time in this church right here where they were building this building and another building in a mission somewhere else at the same time. And guess what? People were afraid. But that fear didn't come from God. It came from the enemy. The enemy says, no, you can't. God never says that. God has given us a spirit of power and of love and of sound mind. Good Christians are not immune to fear. Did you know that? It's a very powerful weapon in the, in the hand of our enemy. Peter, would you consider Peter to be kind of a big deal? I would. It's the same fear that Peter felt the night that he denied Christ. It grips Christians today. It's the same fear that caused King Saul to shudder at the appearance and the challenges of Goliath. That fear is everywhere. Such moments of paralyzing fear come from the enemy, but not from God. The enemy uses those. Three things that God has given us in this verse that we and Timothy need to get in order to endure and to serve. He talks about the might that we need. He said God has given us power. As we serve God, we're going to need God-given boldness and strength. One of my favorite verses is Galatians 6, 9. And be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap if you what? if you faint not. God's going to give us the might that we need. You might be a timid person. You know, you think about this. Timothy, I'm guessing, may have been a timid person by nature. And, and, but God gave him a new spirit. And listen, I want to tell you something. You might be a timid person, but if you will get behind the Holy Spirit of God, he will give you the might that you need to do the work that you need to do for him. He'll give you strength. I tell people all the time, if you're afraid to witness, here's what you need to do to overcome it. Just go start witnessing to people. I went snow skiing in 2004 for the very first time, and I was so excited. And I went to school. I paid good money to go to this school to talk to a guy to teach me how to ski who couldn't barely speak English. And he kept telling me things, and I didn't understand what he was saying. And he would say, do this and do that, and I couldn't do it. And I said, you know what, here's what I'll do. I'll drop out of ski school. I'll do it like I've done everything else. I'll just go straight to the top of the mountain. And we'll either figure it out or we'll go home. To heaven, that is. <laughs> I got up there and I had a spirit of fear. I ain't going to lie to you. I got up there. It's, it's higher when you're looking down the mountain. Then when you're looking up the mountain. 
And I get there and I think, what have I done? And I began to pray that God would deliver me. But here's what I did. I thought, you know, the only way I know how to get over this is turn these skis downhill and head for the bottom. And I did. There was one time it looked like a NASCAR wreck. I lost everything on my body for a long ways. I had snow all over me and all in my ears and in my eyes. People were bringing me my stuff off the mountain. I just it looked like I exploded. But I overcame my fear. I love to go snow skiing today. When it comes down to serving the Lord Jesus Christ, people are afraid. Let me tell you how to witness to somebody. You just start witnessing to them. And I'll tell you this, and I'm not making this up. Because believe this or not, I used to be a timid person. I used to be, quit, quit laughing. <laughs> I used to be shy and bashful. And uh, y'all think I'm lying. I'm not lying. I'm being serious. I used to be bashful and shy. I started, and I remember the first time I ever gave a devotional, I was scared to death. And I started witnessing to people when I would go places. But I'm going to tell you this as a truth from God himself. I'm telling you what the good Lord knows. If you will obey God, he will empower you with boldness that you can't conjure up on your own anywhere else. It's amazing. It's amazing. I've stood and talked to people, and I'm speaking to them thinking, I don't know where this courage is coming from because normally I would be afraid. I had a, I had a massive man walk through this hallway about three years ago. I mean a massive bodybuilding man stuck his head in my door and said, I'm looking for Matt Raines. And I said, does he owe you money? <laughs> he said, no, but he changed my life. I said, well, I am he whom you seek. Have a seat. And here's what he told me. I'm talking about a big boy. He said, Matt, I came in here three years ago with a drug problem and lost, and you stood in that hallway and spoke to me like nobody had ever spoke to me before. He said, and I've never forgot it. He said, now I've given my life to Christ, and I wanted to come back and tell you that I appreciate you having the boldness to stand in my face and tell me the truth about my sin and my future. And I said, I barely even remember that. He said, but nobody had ever stood and spoke to me like that before. Now listen, that boldness only comes from the Lord himself. He will give you the might that you need. If you are fearful and you are dormant, that fear comes from the enemy. It does not come from God. He gives us a spirit of power, a spirit of might, friends. He will give you the might that you need. Secondly, he will give you the motive that you need. He gives us a spirit of love. The great thing that we can have if we are to ever overcome fear is the, is to, and continue to serve is the continuing love of the Lord God himself. 1 John 4.18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Friends, he gives us a spirit of love, and that perfect love is casting out our fear. It's the same might and the same motive that would cause a, a little shepherd boy to stand in front of Goliath and say, I, I will not back down from this man. He's defying the armies of the living God. It's that same motive and that same might that would cause him to step up and, and stand out when everybody else is fleeing over the hills afraid of Goliath. It is that might that would cause that little boy to stand up and say that this uncircumcised Philistine, God, will deliver him into my hands. God gives that kind of might and that kind of motive. And then he gives us thirdly the mind that we need. In verse 8, he says, or verse 7, he says, he gives us the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. The idea here is that someone who is self-disciplined rather than someone who is self-indulgent. Oftentimes, we're very self-indulgent. But a sound mind is someone who's disciplined in their thoughts, people who are self-indulgent seem to be laxed. And sometimes people who are self-indulgent will neglect the gift that God has given them. How can I help myself, Brother Matt? How can I help myself to be disciplined in my thought life and to have a sound, disciplined mind? I'll, I'll tell you how. A little less garbage coming into your mind and a little bit more of the Word of God. 
Friends, we have garbage coming in all over us all of the time through our television and through our radios, and we fill our hearts and our minds with garbage, and we wonder why our minds and our bodies are more self-indulgent than they are self-disciplined. But here's what we ought to do. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8 says, Finally, my brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, and whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, Whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. We spend so much time and so much of our days just filtering garbage into our lives and trying to filter some of it out, and we wonder why we're so consumed with the things that we are, why we're so self-indulgent and not self-disciplined. And when we become that way, we become laxed in our service. We begin to neglect the gifts that God has put in us. We don't stir them up. So Timothy is told by Paul to stir up the gift of God. Number two, he's told to stand up for the gospel of God. Look at verse 8. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. The idea here in verse 8 is to not be ashamed. Many today are apathetic towards the Word of God and towards the work of God, and some are just simply ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Why else would they not stand? He tells Timothy that we must be, first of all, be willing to stand for the cause. Are you willing to stand for the cause of Jesus Christ, or are you ashamed? I read a story, and I know it's an old story, and many of you heard it before, but it's so good it bears telling again. And I'll read it to you. Some years back, before skin grafts were a common medical procedure, a certain girl throughout all of her life openly showed her shame for the deep scars that covered both of her mother's hands. The girl was so ashamed of her mother's hands that she constantly insisted that her mother wear gloves whenever they were out in public so that she would not be embarrassed. This attitude of the daughter, uh, on the daughter's part continued into her adult years, bringing daily heartbreak to her mother after a short illness in the in a day that medical science had not got, had not created a cure for pneumonia the mother died while the body laid in state in the funeral parlor the child's aunt called her to her side and told her the reason why her mother's hands were so terribly scarred it happened when the little girl was a mere babe while playing one evening near the fireplace she had lost her balance and fell into the burning flame. Her mother immediately plunged her hands into the fire and grabbed her baby, not waiting to locate a cloth or a blanket. She put out the fire with her own hands. Miraculously, the baby was spared severe burns, but the mother's hands were grievously burned. After weeks and bandages, her mother's hands were finally unwrapped, exposing the deep and hideous scars that told the story of a mother's love for her child after her aunt finished the story the girl broke out in uncontrollable weeping and ran toward the coffin which held her mother's body she swiftly removed the white gloves that color covered her mother's hands and began kissing them again and again the guilt that she felt for the years that she had ridiculed the scars and unsightly appearance of her mother's hands now collapsed upon the girl with a vengeance while kissing her mother's hands, the girl kept repeating, these scars were for me. Listen, the scars on the Lord Jesus Christ were for me. The scars on the Lord Jesus Christ are for you, for all of us. And we should never be ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ. Shame on us if we're ever ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ. Shame on us if we're ever ashamed of his testimony or his prisoner Paul and those who wrote this glorious Bible for us. Shame on us. What makes Christians ashamed of the gospel today, you ask Brother Matt? The answer is typically it's sin in the life of the Christian that makes them ashamed. It's not Jesus typically. It's the sin that haunts our lives that would not allow us to be an effective testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, when our sin comes to the surface, we have to shrink away from the gospel because we're not worthy vessels to carry it. Paul says, don't be ashamed of the testimony of 
Jesus. We're talking about the testimony that changed the world. <laughs> We're talking about the testimony that has altered the course of human history. We're talking about the testimony that has changed the lives of countless millions upon millions of people. Why would we ever be ashamed of the testimony of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ? We have to be willing to stand for the cause. If we're going to have an effective ministry, we have to stir up the gift of God, and we have to stand up for the gospel of God. Paul said in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And in Galatians 3.8, he called it the glorious gospel. Why would we ever be ashamed of the glorious gospel? We have to be willing to stand for the cause, and we have to be willing, secondly, to suffer the cost. He said at the end of verse 8, this is where it gets tricky for many people. He says, but be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. You see that? Now listen real close as I reveal something to you that may be a secret to you. Serving Jesus will cost you something, and it should. For many, it costs them their lives. Paul wasn't writing these words arbitrarily. The apostles, the disciples, did not take this flippantly. The testimony of Jesus Christ cost them their lives. I think about Jim Elliott, one of the most famous missionaries, missionary to Ecuador, died in an ambush on the riverbanks there trying to reach the people, those people. He died at the hands of those he was trying to reach with the gospel. His family was asked about him dying there on that riverbank, and here's how they responded. Jim didn't die on that riverbank in Ecuador. Jim died the day he got on the plane to go there. See, Jim had died to himself daily. He'd already died. He didn't count his life as valuable to him. Just like Paul talked about in Acts 20, 24, when he said, but none of these things move me. Neither do I count my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Paul understood when he said, Timothy, you have to be willing to stand up for the gospel and suffer the afflictions of the gospel. Paul understood that it was going to cost him and cost him very dearly. And he said, I'm willing to pay the cost. And if you're going to have an effective ministry, Timothy, you have to be willing to pay the cost. We have to as well. Every church that's ever done anything for the Lord Jesus that's been worth mentioning or listening to or looking at, it's cost them something. And it's going to cost us something. It's going to cost us, listen, it's going to cost us something much more than money. It's going to cost us sweat. It's going to cost us some some blood and some tears and some time. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to call us to stir up the gifts that are in us because your gift is not my gift and my gift is not yours. And I need yours as much as you need mine and we need each other. We're all part. We're all members of one body. And it's going to cost us. And the churches that are anemic and struggle who do not have effective ministries are the ones where there's just a small number of people who are paying the cost. It's a big bill. Thirdly, he tells us one last thing, and I'll wrap it up. Not only we are to stir up the gift of God and stand up for the gospel of God, but we need to study up on the grace of God. I mean, look at verses 9 through 11. He says, Who hath saved us? And called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, 
who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. If you want to light the fires of ministry in your life, you say, well, Brother Rains, my fire has, has dimmed down and I'm not sure how to even stir it up into a blaze anymore. I'll tell you how to do it. You ready? Study up on the grace of God. And if that doesn't light your fire, then I'm afraid your fire was probably never lit. You study up on the grace of God. Think about the mystery of this grace. The mystery of this grace. Do you understand everything there is to know about this verse or about this grace of the Lord Jesus Christ? I don't. I know this. It's a mystery. <laughs> it's a mystery because it's not of our works. That's a mystery to the world. Did you know that? Most people think that their going to heaven is based on their good works. But he said this right here in verse 9, has, he has called us not according to our works. That's a mystery to some people. It's not based on you and your goodness. It's based on his grace and his mercy. It's a mystery because it is conformed to God's purpose and not to ours. It's a mystery because it took place before the starting of time. The Bible says before the foundations of the world began. It's a mystery because the grace of God is completely unmerited and it has been hidden. It was hidden from the Old Testament prophets. And it's a mystery because it's offered both to the Jew and to the Gentile. Nobody can understand the full mystery of this. But I want to tell you something. If you want to stir your heart and you want to know how you can get your fire lit for the Lord Jesus Christ, you go study on the grace that has reached down and pulled you out of the miry clay and set your feet on the rock to stay. You go study the grace that looks at the darkest sin in your life and says, I can remove it and I can replace it. You look at that grace, friends. You take your eyes and you take them to Calvary's hill and you lift them up and you see the Savior there, bloody and scarred for your sin and my sin, who cries out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, friends, if you get there and your fire is not lit, it probably never was. Study up on the grace of God. How it could reach down to somebody so indignant and so self-arrogant and, and so filled with pride and still save them. It's unmerited. He talks about the manifestation of this grace in verse 10. He said, but now it's made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ. The mystery is removed as the grace of God is made manifest by the appearing of Jesus Christ. It was hidden. Nobody understood. But when Jesus came, he was the grace of God in flesh. He's our salvation. He's our substitute. He's the one who, who John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. There he is. You don't know where your salvation comes from. It's Him, the Lamb of God, our substitute. He's our subduer. He, the Bible says here in the end of this verse that He has abolished death and brought life and immortality through the light of the gospel. He's abolished death. Let me ask you something. Do you fear death? Does the thought of your body lying in state funeral home does it bother you and if you're shaking your head no that's because of the grace of God but I want to tell you something many people don't know about the grace of God and the thought of death scares them to death he's abolished death you study up on that <laughs> and how he, he has brought life where there was death, we were, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And now he has quickened us by his spirit and made us alive. And we have passed from death unto life. You study on that. It will stir up your heart. And then lastly, he talks about the mandate of this grace in verse 11. He said, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Paul, Paul understood that he had a God-given mandate to share this gospel. Paul didn't just want to be a partaker of this grace of God. He wanted to be a proclaimer of this grace of God. He said, I've been appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Friends, you and I have been appointed. We've been appointed. 
You say, well, I just don't know if, if being a proclaimer of the gospel is for me. It, it is. If you're in the Lord's army, it's a mandate. Some people say, well, I just, I didn't feel called. Who needs a call when you got a command? Go ye therefore and preach the gospel. That's a command. Paul understood that, and he was willing to take it. Take it to the Gentiles. That's, that's you and me. Aren't you glad he did his job? Say, Paul, you had one job. Right? He did it. Thank God that Paul did his job. I'm going to have our musicians come. We're going to prepare to close. Look with me at verse 12 as we close out here. It says, For, for the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless, I am not ashamed. I like that. For I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Now I want to ask you a question. Number one, do you know whom you have believed? Is Jesus Christ your Lord and your Savior today? And if he's not, tonight would you come? That mystery of the gospel, the grace of God, has been removed. Jesus Christ has appeared. He came and he died on the cross as a substitute for your sin and for mine. And if you're here today and you're lost, you can know in whom you believe. You can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you would just cry out to him tonight by faith and say, God, I, I know that Jesus came and he died for me on the cross, and tonight I want to ask you to forgive me of my sin. God will forgive you those sins based on the fact that Jesus paid for them on that cross. And tonight, you can put your faith and trust in Jesus. And you, like Paul, can say, I'm not ashamed. I know in whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. If you don't know, come and give your life to Jesus tonight. Be saved. Know the pardon of your sin. And if you, like Paul, can say, I know whom I believe, and I am persuaded, can you also say, I'm not ashamed? Can you say that? You say, yeah, I'm, I'm not ashamed, Brother Matt. Then, then you have a mandate to preach the gospel. If we're going to light the fires of an effective ministry in this church, we're going to have to stir up the gift of God. Friends, we're going to have to figure out what it is that God's put in you and bring it out. We're going to stand up with the gospel of God. And then we're going to study up on the grace of God and let that keep the fire ablaze. That's one of my great fears. I don't have a lot of fears. But one of my fears is that the fire may go out someday. I pray it never does. I've had people say, well, you're crazy. I've had little kids when I was preaching say, he's mad. I'm not mad. I'm passionate. You know, and I just, we don't want to have zeal without knowledge. But boy, we don't want to have a lot of knowledge without any zeal either. We need some passion. We need to stir up fires in our lives. I pray the grace of God does it. That's the only thing I can know that does it. I, I can't stir your fire every week. I can't come to your home. I can't go to your job and stir your fire every week. Only the grace of God can do that. We need a fresh approach to studying God's word. We need to be on our knees saying, God, don't let the fire go out. And I want to tell you this, friends. This is you can You can live this out with me if you'd like, but you stay in that right there. That's all the kindling for a fire you'll ever need. Your fire will never go out. It's when we close this right here, the fire begins to burn down. And we begin to become stagnant and indifferent. And, oh, well, that's the preacher's job. Well, brother so-and-so will do it. Now, sister so-and-so, she'll take care of it. I'm sure she'll take care of that. Some... Somebody, brother, somebody will take care of No, it's time for me and you to do our job.